starting again, starting now. Let's talk about livable Appalachia. Welcome to session one of the four part livable Appalachia summit. I'm standing here in the cornfields of Western North Carolina. Each session is designed to inspire, create connections, build momentum and share best practices. The goal to develop communities in our region that vibrantly support aging affordably, safely and well. Why is this important? Because we know that if a community supports an 80 year old, it supports an eight year old and everyone in between and beyond. If you're from the Appalachian region, you understand that both our rural communities and our urban centers have unique assets, most notably the land, including the plants and animals, the people and the culture. Many parts of our region are growing with an increasing number of people who are 65 plus. This session will focus on strategies for smart, sustainable growth that preserves the natural assets of our land, public spaces, and culture for people of all ages. My name is Rebecca Chaplin. I'm privileged to work at AARP as an everyday innovator in aging. I live in the mountains of Western North Carolina, and this topic is important to me because I want to age in my community, and I want to empower others to choose how they live as they age. I will stop sharing those poll results and we'll get to that question in a little bit. One of the most wonderful parts of co-creating this event was working collaboratively across state lines and sectors. This series was cultivated by staff and volunteers in AARP Virginia and AARP Tennessee. It was informed by professionals in the field of aging, in the field of community and economic development. And it was actively planned by volunteers Sarah Knapp, Kim Dickens, Alan Briggs, Steve Studebaker, Gail McCord, intern Raphael Albuquerque, Area Agency on Aging Director at the Land of Sky Regional Council, Leanne Tucker, Community and Economic Development Director at the Land of Sky Regional Council, Erica Anderson, and Asheville on Bikes Executive Director, Mike Sewell. It takes a village. We are going to move right into the heart of the program in a few moments. Before we get started, I wanna let you know what to expect because today's event will be dynamic and it's going to move quickly. We will start with a keynote presentation by an engaging and vibrant director and founder of 880 Cities, Gil Penalosa. After his presentation, Gil will have about five minutes to take your questions. One of our team members will be monitoring the chat and clustering the themes of your questions for the most efficient use of time. After Gil's presentation, we will take a short commercial break and learn more about Main Street, North Carolina and their supportive roles for small towns in North Carolina. This will be followed by another lively round of short presentations featuring local guests in multiple sectors from Tennessee, Virginia and North Carolina. We will have another short Q&A with all presenters before finishing at 1130. My colleague Erica Anderson will be moderating the discussion with our presenters. So Raphael, you can bring in our leading speaker now. Are you ready? If so, go ahead and type an enthusiastic comment in the chat. Please feel free to be empowered to use this monitor chat at any time because this event is about us. It's about all of us. Your participation is valued. And now, welcome Gil Penalosa, founder and director of 880 Cities. Gil, I know our time is limited, so I am gonna let you take it away. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm, I'm gonna, since our name is worth a thousand words, and I'm gonna uh, share, but you need to allow me to share a screen. Uh, this it still says host disabled screen sharing. Yep, I'm I'm getting right to it. No, uh, Gil, I'm sorry about that. It's happening right now. There you go. Okay, do you see my screen now? We can see your screen, Gil, you got it. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. It's 39.7. That's the increase of life expectancy in the US in the last 150 years. 20.9 is the increase in the last 100 years. This is a few months ago, we celebrated the first man on the moon. But I think this is even more amazing. Think about it. We've been around humans for around 200,000 years. In 200,000 years, up until 150, the life expectancy was only 39. We've doubled that. In the last 150 years, we doubled the life expectancy. That's really incredible. And mostly it's healthy years. Mostly it's healthy years. Uh, but nevertheless, there is such a negative perception about older people. Yes, our body ages, but our mind, our spirit does not. And as Bernard, George Bernard Joshua said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. We must play forever. And people, older people are happier and, and enjoying lives. But people keep saying, oh, it's a great tsunami. What? The tsunamis are always negative. Living longer is positive. The tsunamis are unpredictable. Population aging is nothing as easy as to predict. I mean, whoever's in their 50s now, 10 years from now is gonna be in their 60s. I mean, if you if we view aging as decline, it's gonna become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we need to change our mindset. We need to, ageism is discrimination by age of any age. Don't do this because you are a child. Don't talk about politics because you are too young. Don't work because you are old. And the reality is that this is the happiness curve. And one thing that we must understand is that our happiest years in our life is our childhood and as older adults. And we must understand, I mean, my children are in, in their early 30s and they're having to deal with where they have children or not, if they, if they lose their job or not, and where are they gonna live, how are they gonna live and so on. So it's interesting. And people keep thinking about older people with Alzheimer. Only one out of 10 will get Alzheimer. The other nine are gonna get anxiety of Alzheimer. We forget someone's name and we say, oh my God, I'm getting it. I mean, ageism is dumb. Ageism is dumb. It's prejudice against our children, against our parents, or against our own future selves. Aging is not a problem to solve or a disease to cure. Aging is living. We start aging since the moment that we are born. So we need to fight ageism. Uh, so no more too old or too young. Let's remove that out of our vocabulary and stop blaming older for everything that is bad. It, that we don't gain anything by fighting within generations. And by the way, a lot of things have happened from the olders. Uh, just 30 years ago, we had 4 billion people with clean water. Now we got over 7 billion. Uh, just for th 40 years ago, we had almost half of the population in the world living in extreme poverty, less than $2 per day. Today, less than one out of 10. The children, the death of children has gone down almost for, by everything. And of course, the life expectancy has increased. Part of it because fewer children are dying and half of it is because we are living longer. Not longer, much, much longer. And with life expectancy increased, by the way, it's not just in Appalachia, it's everywhere. Look at these are the countries of the world. Just 200 years ago, we didn't have any country, including the US, with a life expectancy above 45. Now we don't have any with a life expectancy below 45. Basically, this is due to vaccination and clean water and sewage. And we are living longer, much, much longer, and it's great. You know, the people that have ever lived to 60 in the history of humanity, half are alive today, half. This is something new and people are enjoying. People are gardening and eating ice cream and enjoying games with their grandchildren in the park. It's really exciting. And, the, and there's also a lot of money in the US, the population over 60, if it was an independent country, it would be the third largest economy in the world. And the population over 60 in the Appalachian region and all over the US are, is gonna double, is gonna double. And the population over 80, is gonna quadruple. So we must think of this 
as a, our third act that must be older, healthier, and happier. And when I created this, which I hope some might be a movement, our third act, is because our life is, is like a, a theater, three acts. The first act is since we are born to the 20s, when we are very dependent, uh, we are being educated. The second act is from the 20s to the late 50s, when we are working and dealing with all of this anxiety. And then our third act, 60s, till end of life. And it's a full third of our life. And the population all across the Appalachian is growing very, very fast, actually faster than in other places in the three states. Uh, so this is a full third of our life is gonna continue and everybody could live healthier and happier. I know that the last three or five, three to five years, people become kind of dependent, some very dependent, but that's only 15% of our life as older adults. The other 25 years, which is 85%, we're pretty independent. So, and, 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 and also both dependent and independent should live healthier and happier. And part of it is the environment. So what is the role of livable communities in this? Uh, of older adults living healthier and happy because older adults wanna learn and wanna be outside and wanna do activities. When the US doubled the life expectancy, it's clear that we learn to survive. But with issues such as equity or lack of equity, climate change, public health crisis, we must learn how to live. And it could be very civilized, people walking, riding bicycles, using public transit, everyone with access to nature in the mountains, in the rural areas, in the community, in the cities. Uh, I mean, the population in the US is gonna grow between 80 and 100 million in the next 40 years. That means you're, the US needs about to do about 50 million homes. Uh, and that's why you are also seeing a lot of people moving into Asheville and many other areas of the Appalachian region. Uh, because I mean, 50 million homes is a lot of homes. It's like all of the homes in Canada, France, and Australia together. Uh, and in many ways, the way we are doing cities is, I mean, hundreds of years ago, we were doing it like Florence. This is at the same scale, a highway intersection. It seems like we learn how to do cities and we, then we all learn how to do cities. And cities do not decide the what, the population, uh, but the cities do decide the, the how, the how. And this is how we've been building cities in the last 30, 40, 50 years. Instead of parks, we are doing parking lots. And it, this is really incredible. Imagine the children, the elderly, people with disabilities. This is how we've been trying to solve mobility. So no wonder so many people are moving to the Appalachia region. People are looking for something else. People are looking for nature, for the mountains, for small cities, for small communities, for a different quality of life. But nevertheless, the priority has to be the local, the local, the local. Then the people that wanna move in and then the tourists. So I, I think the quality of life has to be about, about local. So we need to improve the communities that we have today and also create great communities for many people, but we need to plan our community radically different and manage it also different. But this is also a great opportunity in many ways and a responsibility because whatever you do or don't do with the communities over the next 30, 40 years is how people are gonna live for hundreds of years. In the US, just like Rebecca wants to age in place, almost everybody also wants to age in place, so which is something interesting. And then part of it is moving. And but we're gonna talk about mobility in the fourth session. Uh, and while we were thinking about mobility and climate change that we see the symptoms everywhere, even if some don't wanna believe in it, uh, COVID arrived, COVID-19 arrived. And some people say all change. I think not much has changed. I think in more than the, what changed is the perception. It's like if we had gotten some magnifying glasses to see our communities and all of the sudden, something that we thought was invisible became visible, like the homeless people sleeping in the parks, in the streets, in the sidewalks, in the parking lots, when 80% of the hotels were empty, so the lack of equity. But at the same time, we, people have, were moving less, fewer cars, and with fewer cars, the air was cleaner. So we need to decide, post-COVID, do we wanna go back to this? Or do we want a new cleaner air and a different way of living? 
So this is why it's so important throughout the day to think in the Appalachia region, how do we want to live? I think the post COVID has to be around health, equity, sustainability. And when I'm talking about health, I'm talking about the world, the health definition is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well being. It's not just not being sick. And when I'm talking about sustainability, I'm talking about sustainable happiness. Sustainable happiness is the happiness that contributes to the individual, the community, or the global well being. As long as it doesn't exploit other people, the environment, or future generations. And equity is giving everybody what they need to be successful. It's not the same thing as equality. Equality is giving everybody the same. No, some people are starting so far behind that we need to give them more. It's like someone did a cartoon that is very explanatory. They said, this is equality. Everybody gets the one box. Uh, no, some people might need two or three, others might not need any box. And someone said, well, if that's equality and that's equity, maybe this is reality. It's even worse than we can imagine. But I think that in the Appalachia, whether it is in, the, in North Carolina or Virginia or Tennessee, you think outside the box. Maybe it's not about moving boxes. Maybe it's about tearing down walls. It's, it's about thinking differently. So we must ensure equity before we can actually even think of equality. So how do you want the communities in the Appalachia to become? I think is about equitable and sustainable where all their adults will live healthier and happier. And I think it's, it's completely doable and we're gonna talk about specifically how to do this and make it healthier and happier. We had a horrible situation, but from this horrible situation also we saw opportunities. When we didn't have enough parks, then people went to the streets. You know, in the urban areas, not in the rural, but in the urban areas, the streets cover between 25 and 35% of the area. It's the biggest public space. And then we had to go out and be socially connected, but physically separated. And there was not enough space on the sidewalks. So people went to the streets, whether it's Oakland, New Zealand, or Oakland, California. Look at this Oakland, California. They created 72 miles of slow streets in 24 hours. What is slow streets? That all of the streets in the neighborhood are only for the cars that, of people that live in that street. So if you are going from point A to point B, you use the arterials. If there is a traffic jam, you don't cut through the neighborhood. So all of a the sudden there were very little traffic and very slow and less than 10 miles an hour on, on the neighborhood streets and children and older adults and people on wheelchairs, people with mental and physical disabilities, enjoying less noise, cleaner air, safety. Now the mayor said that 90% of those are gonna stay on. And with fewer cars, all of a sudden we started seeing that people were building bicycle corridors and connecting, something that used to take years and years, decades. All of a sudden wasn't even taking months, was taking weeks and people were interconnecting the cities. And this was exciting how all of the sudden protected bikeways, people said, oh, it cannot be done. Well, actually it was done. And bus only lanes and also markets, they couldn't do it inside. So they started doing it on the streets, in the public spaces, even places like San Francisco, turning a golf course where only 200 people play in a day maximum, they turn it into a public park. And now thousands and thousands of people could, could enjoy the park. So something that seemed impossible became possible. And some people were celebrating and they thought, oh, what a great opportunity. Now we're gonna create linear parks instead of streets. Well, actually we should. There's a lot of streets that should be turned into green areas, but it's not gonna be easy because there's also a lot of people moving in their other direction, wanting more cars, more isolation, more sprawl. So we need to change. So how are we gonna do this for everyone? I mean, I, an older adult, now I have a grandchild, so I think about this a lot. And I've been lucky to have worked in over 350 different cities around the world, small, large, and Everywhere people say, Gil, what's 880 cities? Well, 880 cities is not about parks or streets or walking or cycling. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we help create successful communities? For example, I'm not, when I, I'm going person, I like to see the venue where I'm gonna speak. Here in Warsaw, I was gonna speak outdoors and the night before I see all of these people dancing. 
many all mostly older adults and then i see the dj dj vika i told you we're living longer the fastest growing segment of business of entrepreneurs in the us are people over 55 over 60 it's not the people at 18 people retire from a formal job and then they set up their companies vika has her own sound music and goes from park to park from city to city organizing dances but anyway 880 is about this healthy communities for children and parents and people in cars and everybody. It's about sustainable happiness. And people say, Gil, but can my children walk to school? Can my grandparents uh, walk to public transit? Can they ride their bike to get eggs or milk? Can they in the rural area, in the urban area? And I said, look, is the rule, we have a rule, we call it 880 rule of, it's like common sense, but common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. Step number one, think of a child that you love, someone around eight years old. When you have the child in mind, step number two, think about an 80 year old, your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters, someone also that you love. And once you have the child and the older adult, step number three, would you send them walking to the park, riding the bike to get eggs or milk? Would they feel safe? If you would, it's because it's safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not, and we gotta do it better. What if everything that you did in Appalachia, the trails, the parks, the, the sidewalks, the crosswalks, the restaurants, the, the schools, the libraries, the stores, everything had to be great for an eight and an 80 year old. Not a 280, eight and 80 as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the eight and it's good for the 80, it's gonna be good for everybody from zero to over a hundred. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30 year old and athletic and create communities for all. That is the concept. And by the way, let's keep in mind, whatever is good for older people is also good for everybody. So that is kind of the magic. So on part of this, I'm gonna go quickly through five actions for well-being and also must have in livable communities. This came out of the World Health Organization is the age-friendly concept. There is eight different tracks that we need. And hopefully many of the communities in the Appalachia region will apply and will become part of it. AARP has done a magnificent job. AARP is a wonderful organization across the US, has 38 million members. And one of the things, now they have over 500 communities of all sizes, from very small towns to very large cities, uh, applying to, and applying these eight domains and taking the communities step by step. But the five actions that I want to talk about being healthier and happier are very important. Why? because to live healthier and happier, 30% is genetics and medical care. And the other 70% is up to us, the social, the behavioral, the environmental, because there is very little we can do about genetics, almost nothing. And not as much about medical care. I mean, the medical care, let's think about, in the, in the geriatric care in the US, of 145 med schools, only 11 have geriatric care. Less than 1% of the nurses go into geriatric. Less than 4% of social workers go into geriatric. There are 7,000 geriatricians in the US. That's only one for every 2,000 Americans over 75. One every 2,000. So 10,000 people are turning 65 in the US every day. 10,000 yesterday, 10,000 today, 10,000 tomorrow. So livable communities is really, really, really important because making sure that we're gonna live healthier and happier, our well-being, which is really being well. Some people say, oh, the secrets. No, there are no secrets. Five actions. First, we gotta eat more plant-based, more plant-based. So we need to have farmer's market and we need to have urban gardening in the rural areas, in the urban areas. This is really critical throughout the year. And also so that the children and the adults and the older adults will learn that the tomatoes don't come out of a factory. And it's also a wonderful intergenerational activity. I'm not asking you to be vegetarian, but if all of us ate half as much meat as we usually do, the impact is the same as if half of us had become vegetarians. Number two, we gotta sleep seven to eight hours. Sleeping is very, very important. I know some people are homeless and I'm not talking about that. See, home, I mean, people also homeless should be welcome to the parks, but that's not a place to live. Uh, but people that have a home, 
seven to eight hours. It's critical. When older people sleep only four or five hours, the next day they forget everything. When people in their 20s sleep four or five hours, they also forget everything. So and the housing, of course, is a human right issue. Three, we need to socialize. Socialize on the sidewalk, in the neighborhood, in the park, in the trails. It's something that is critical to socialize. And it's not about uh, the older people needing that home, no. Imagine the wonderful having a beautiful park. In, in the Appalachian region, there are so many beautiful trails and mountains and that outdoors, 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 outdoors throughout the year. Four, we gotta have contact with nature, contact with nature everywhere at home, on the sidewalk, on the schools, on the trails, everywhere we need to have contact with nature because contact with nature is gonna be good for physical and for mental health. And five, we gotta be physically active. And when I'm talking about physical activity, it decreases premature death, strokes, heart disease, many cancers. So it's really, it's all about 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes, but it has to be five or more days a week. So there's an urgency to be physically active. People are looking for the magic pill. No, there is no magic pill. The only way that in the Appalachian community, people are gonna be physically active. The only way is if we walk or bike or play as a normal part of everyday life. That's why the beautiful trails that you have and the parks, and it, it has to be walking. It's not about doing marathons. It's 30 minutes a day and you can even do 15 in the morning and 15 in the afternoon. So those are the five actions. And then I also said some must have. Local, local, local is very, very critical. I mean, no wonder people want to move to the Appalachia region. It, it, it's really beautiful and this was increasing, but you got to think local first, then the people that will be coming in, then the tourists. So you make it great for local and then eventually will be for all, but it's not the other way around. Also, it's about the benefits. Making a livable community is gonna improve the culture, the education, the happiness, the environment. It's gonna be good for so many things that we gotta work on this economic development. Also, it's about equity. We need to prioritize the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable are everyone that is poor. And there is a huge gaps uh, with everybody with disabilities, with racial minorities, ethnic minorities. So we gotta work on the vulnerable. Everybody has to give something. I mean, President Carter came to Canada to build homes for two weeks. Older people are givers and not takers. Also 10, 20, 30, we need to have a park within walking distance. I mean, older people, uh, we, we gotta have proper play areas. A hundred million people in the US, one out of three who live in urban areas, urban areas of 10,000 or 50,000 or 10 million, one out of three do not have a park within walking distance. We need to change that. And when I say 10, 20, 30, it's because within 10, at least a park. Within 20, an activity park And by 2030. We need infrastructure. And infrastructure, yeah, all the people want walking paths. That is the number one activity, whether we need the beautiful trails in the mountains, but also in the park walking paths and benches, 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 but also restrooms and drinking fountains and shade and trees and so on. So walking is something that is really, really critical and for older people, but for also anybody in the community and parents and babies. This is in Charlotte where I saw how this was the size of a basketball court, but half of it, they did it for children, the other half for adults, an older adult uh, gymnasiums, and then a walking path around it. And that was something that was great, mixing different generations. That is something that is healthy for them. It's about uses and activities. It's not only infrastructure, it's also uses and activities. We need hardware, but we need also software. And it's critical. And it's not only about walking, gardening, knitting, tai chi, yoga, dancing, movies. So all of these activities are something that we need to pay very much attention. It's not about the millions to do the infrastructure. It's about the thousands to making sure that it works, that it clicks, that we facilitate in order to do it. So it's about programs. It's not about an event like the 4th of July. No, it's something that is ongoing, like allotment gardens. Allotment gardens is great for the community, great to socialize, great for intergenerational, whether it's knitting or yoga in the park or taking people on, on bike rides, older adults with young volunteers on their bicycles. All of this is really fantastic. When I was in Australia working in Canberra, beautiful park, but at night it was magical. And with the beautiful mountains that you have, 
what, what, what a magnificent place to do shit in Yoku. What shit in Yoku is from Japan is forest bathing. All you really need is spend time in the trees. Forest bathing is gonna improve health. It doubles every other day, it doubles the anti-cancer cells. It lowers our heart and blood pressure, reduces stress. All you gotta do is, it's not about the running, it's not about music, no telephone, no music. Even if you go with another person, don't talk for 10 minutes. Pay attention to the trees, to the wind, feel the wind, feel, smell the air. The, the ambience. I mean, livable communities is good for health and it has a lot of benefits, but parks and trails, good for physical health, but there is no health without mental health. So let's also focus on mental health. Loneliness causes stress, doubles the possibility of having dementia. Loneliness, the Surgeon General says is like smoking 15 cigarettes in one day. Depression is the world's leading cause of disability. So we need to have contact with nature to improve our mood, our cognitive attention. So whether it is the rural trails or the urban areas with trees or at home, we need to focus on that contact with nature and having nature everywhere in the sidewalks, uh, in, in uh, close to home is, is really, really critical because it's not, it's not just because it looks beautiful, but it's because it's gonna improve our mental and physical health that we need to have nature everywhere. We need to volunteer. Volunteer is gonna give older people a sense of belonging. It's gonna have a, a purpose. And that also is gonna help us live healthier and happier. Let's adopt and let's have groups of volunteers taking care of small parks, small communities, small trails, doing cleanups and taking care, organizing activities. So uh, public engagement, Volunteering is something that is really critical in many ways. Working in, in Arizona, I saw the wonderful botanical garden that has over 600 volunteers, over 55. Also the outdoor activities is 365 days of the year. It's not just during the summer. I mean, during COVID, we saw how people came out to the parks in the middle of the winter. The reality is that there is no such thing as bad weather. It's bad clothing and we can do it outside. I mean, I know that people call it stream weather and in the Appalachian mountains, I know that you have 15 horrible days. Also, this little girl knows it, and you have 45 cold that are not that nice, but you got over 200 nice days. So focus all of your planning on the 200 good days. And then even the bad ones are not gonna be that bad. We need to change our minds and have a positive attitude and organize lots and lots and lots of programs. And the programs in the winter, of course, whether it's Tai Chi or it's yoga or it's moving the park. Okay, they move in the park in the winter. We need to have better sound and better music and hot chocolate and beaver tails. And look at this, this is minus 30 degrees, the river is frozen and people are outside doing activities or here the people are ice fishing. So we gotta change our mindset more than, and sometimes people concerning the winter, not so much about cold, but because it's dark. So let's put a lot of lights and don't call them Christmas lights, call them winter lights and have them there for four months. And it's not just about parks. Let's think about everything that belongs to all of us that is public, that is, that's sustainability. Let's use the streets, the schools, the library, the sidewalks. Let's open up, let's change this pavement in the schools into wonderful green parks. As long as it's used for the school only for, during the school time, then it's open to the community in the evenings, in the, uh, on, on, during the holidays. Uh, and then it becomes a win-win. It's good for everybody to have, instead of having parking, having beautiful park for everyone. We need to learn from each other. And this is a, an activity in, in, in also in, in North Carolina, in Shardor, which was a multi-generation playground, magnificent. Uh, if you don't have a school, take over a street and let's do a street. So, I mean, people wanna go dancing on the streets, magnificent. Now we're living longer and we see in the parks three and four generations. This is my only grandchild and three generations, four generations, people getting together. So this is something that is, is really, really wonderful. So I'm gonna be, you know, let's work on that intergeneration because it's kind of magical. So I wanna end 
by saying, I started saying that it was about health equity and sustainability. There's not gonna be a Martian coming down. I will create a livable Appalachia. I said, we need to plan the community different. These are not technical issues. These are not financial issues. It's about policy, but not about political parties. Every political party must want people living older, healthier and happier. It's with a big P. Everybody needs to participate. We need to develop a shared vision and lots of action. Let's keep in mind that older adults are givers, not takers. Older adults are assets to the community, not liabilities. We want to have a purpose and it's going to help us live longer and healthier. And we want to contribute. And if it's great for the older adults, it's going to be great for everybody. So with the shared vision and lots of action, we're going to move from talking to doing, and we're going to have the equitable and sustainable communities where all live healthier and happier. So Appalachian region, let's do it now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gil. That was very dynamic. I learned a lot. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, one is, do you have like a few steps uh, that we can take to create more accessible green spaces for intergenerational. Excuse me? Do you have a few steps that we can take to create more intergenerational accessible green space? Yeah, it, it is very important. For example, every time that we do a playground, let's make sure that we do that playground with a nice cozy area for parents and grandparents. Otherwise, the grandparents come with the grandchildren, a magical opportunity, and they will get bored in five minutes if it's cold in the winter or hot in the summer. But if there's a nice cozy place to sit, uh, then it's gonna be win-win. The child is gonna love playing in the playground and the, or, and the grandparent is gonna sit and have a coffee and socialize. So that issue of loneliness. So both will wanna go to the playground the grandfather. So it is it, thinking about that. It's making sure that it, when, when they are in the community and walking, make sure that it's safe for the grandchild and the older. The trails are kind of magical places. But once again, when they are walking, uh, children need to rest, older adults need to rest. It's not about putting plastic uh, benches on the trails, no, keeping beautiful and natural, but have a place. So always thinking about that. And, and let's keep in mind that it, it's a win-win. It, it's good for the children, but it's also fantastic for the older adults. I enjoy those too. Um, can, do you think that city, city planning agencies have as a rule, a certain percentage of seniors on their boards? I think it's critical to think about the older adults and have a voice everywhere. I think that we need to always say, oh, we need to have young people. Of course, we need to have young people, but also we need to have older people. Older people also, they are a huge asset. It's one third of our lives we're gonna be as older adults. So we need to engage on how to do it. Let me give you an example. In one city in Kentucky, a small city in Kentucky I went and I walked with the mayor for about eight blocks and I didn't see any benches. And I said, mayor, what happened with the benches? And then he said, Gil is the homeless. So I said, what, you think this is magic? You take out a bench and a home shows up? Uh, if the homeless doesn't have a bench, then the homeless is gonna sleep on the, on the sidewalk. But I said, you are also affecting the older people. Older people will not walk if there are no benches. Maybe they might not even use it, but they wanna know if I get tired, I'm gonna sit. And all of these things, they, they, you, you bring that knowledge from the older adult that will tell the planners, hey planners, we need to have benches on the sidewalks and we need to have trees and we need to have traffic lights with enough time for, for anybody to cross the street. Uh, so it, it's very important for planners that to listen also to the older adults and for the older adults to participate. This is not a time for older adults to be spectators. No, be engaged and participate. And, and, and also not only on the hardware of what happens in the Appalachian region, but also on the software, the programs, how to get older people out in the summer, but how to get them out also in the winter time that is safe and enjoyable. Excellent, and I think we have one more question uh, that we have time for. 
someone said their community recently redesigned town walking routes. Uh, how can we add green space to those routes? How do we add green space to which? To uh, town walking routes. Well, we need to add green space everywhere. So on the sidewalks, it's very critical to have trees. That is gonna be good for health, it's gonna be good for climate change. Yeah. Also in the summer, people are gonna walk and they are gonna have a little bit of shade. So we need there, we need green in the schools, we need green near the factory, we need green on the trails, uh, everywhere. And sometimes it can be small pocket parks or only very, very, very small. Even some people are taking two car parking and creating a small pocket park where there used to be two, two cars. So it doesn't have to be gigantic. It, it's making, making that connection that we can use, to, but, but the, part of it is having realizing that it's not only because it's gonna look pretty, it's also because it's gonna be good for our physical and for our mental and emotional health. And this is something, I mean, the pandemic has been horrible, but one of the good things of the pandemic is that people realize the benefits of nature. And with all of those mountains that you have, it's also nice to have many of the trails along the mountains interwoven into the community so that people don't have to drive to the trail, but they can walk or run or bike to the trails and they must be interwoven. So I think that that is also something that, 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 that is critical and, and not to think that it has to be a gigantic parks. No, it can be from tiny uh, pocket parks. So more, more than anything, it is gonna have a, a community wide plan so that every citizen in every community would have a green place to, to go and enjoy and play uh, because it, it, this is going to be good also for economic development. And also when you densify, also it's not about, some people are terrified that many people are coming into the Appalachia region. Well, you can have beautiful density with four, five, six story buildings. It's not about doing 20 story buildings. People don't hate those 20, 30 story buildings, but you can have the same density in the downtown, in the main street. For example, the main streets are gonna be much more vibrant and exciting. If instead of being one or two floors, they are six or seven, then you're gonna have more people. So there will be more coffee places and more restaurants and more ice cream places and libraries and things. And also let's promote the walkability so that when people that live in the rural areas and come into the urban area, don't park in one place, get milk, then get on the car one block to get bread, one block to get, no, have a campaign. I saw in a small community that had a beautiful campaign, park and walk promoting that park only once and then go and get your bread, get your beers, get the other things. And then all of a sudden people realize how many other shops there were in town that they hadn't even thought about. So having strong, vibrant main streets is, is something that is, that, that, that is it's also important and also eliminating conflict between the ones living in the rural area and the ones in the urban, but it has to be interwoven. It has to be a win-win benefit to both. Gil, thank you so much. I learned a ton and that's a great segue into our, our next piece. Um, for many of our communities, building capacity and connection is a critical foundation to sustainable development. And the Main Street program is a capacity building asset that is strengthening communities throughout Appalachia. We'll learn more for the video from them. Thank you, Gil, very much. North Carolina Main Street. The Main Street program is a downtown revitalization initiative that was created by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and is managed nationally by the National Main Street Center and statewide by the North Carolina Main Street and Rural Planning Center within the North Carolina Department of Commerce Rural Economic Development Division. The North Carolina Main Street and Rural Planning Center works in regions, counties, cities, towns, downtown districts, and in designated North Carolina Main Street communities to inspire placemaking through building asset-based economic development strategies that achieve measurable results, such as investment, business growth, and jobs. Our team helps communities identify their unique assets and then builds economic development strategies that are implemented through the Main Street 4-Point Approach 
for downtown revitalization. The four-point approach includes economic vitality, quality design, authentic promotion, and a strong organizational foundation. Our team works with 80 communities located across the state from Murphy to Manio that are working to improve their downtown districts through the Main Street program. 16 of our designated Main Street communities and three small town Main Street programs are in the Appalachian region. In addition to strategic planning, our team offers Main Street program guidance, training and education, and information on grants and funding for project development that is helping to create great places. The program has a high success rate across the state that spurs public and private investment, leverages business development, and creates jobs. We host the largest statewide downtown revitalization conference in the country, offering beginning and advanced level sessions, a statewide awards program, and a Main Street Champions Recognition Ceremony. In collaboration with our local partners, North Carolina Main Street is opening new businesses, renovating iconic buildings, and developing livable communities that attract both residents and visitors to downtown. Since the inception of the program, North Carolina Main Street and small town Main Street communities have experienced more than $4 billion in public and private investment. They have rehabilitated more than 7,000 buildings and nearly 8,000 facades and created more than 7,000 businesses and more than 30,000 jobs. Main Street is economic development at its finest. For more information, contact Liz Parham, Director of the North Carolina Main Street and Rural Planning Center at the Department of Commerce. Now we move to local speakers to learn more about asset-based development happening throughout Appalachia in agriculture, outdoor recreation, arts and culture, and economic opportunities. We will start with Sylvia Crum. Good morning. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Erica. And Gil, thank you. What an exciting and dynamic presentation. Your information has inspired me and has really let me know that what I'm going to have to do as a woman leaving my second act and moving into my third act, um, what I'm going to have to do is really uh, do a paradigm shift around what I can offer. So I'm here today to talk to you about Appalachian Sustainable Development. I'm the Director of Communications and Development for this fine organization, and we've been around since 1995 serving Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. Originally, we served about 15 counties in our primarily rural footprint. Today, we also reach into communities in West Virginia, parts of Kentucky and Ohio. ASD's mission is to build a local and regional thriving food and ag system that creates healthy communities, respects the planet and cultivates prop profitable opportunities for Appalachians. So we have a wide variety of programs uh, that boost local economies through sustainable agriculture initiatives and fight food insecurity in a lot of different kinds of ways. When I was thinking about our towns growing with grace, I really started thinking about a lot of the passion and the imagination of rural Appalachians and their interest in not just preserving assets, saving land, respecting culture, and honoring people, but how young people and old people are working together to facilitate what I would call a rebirth of the culture and traditions of the region that are also shaping opportunities for the future. Um, as someone who came to the region in 1994 from Chicago, I've learned a lot about the resiliency of the communities that we serve through our organization and a lot of the work that has been driven here for generations and generations has been driven by people uh, much older than myself. They are the knowledge keepers, they are the storytellers, they are the granny witches of Central Appalachia. Uh, the average age of farmers in our region is 59 years old. 
And that would probably be a number that you might also see um, referred to across the country as far as farming and agriculture goes. So in, nine, in 2000, we opened the Appalachian Harvest Food Hub. And at that time, we opened that facility to serve tobacco farmers who were losing their allotments. These tobacco farmers were multi-generational farmers. They wanted to stay on their land, but they didn't know what they were gonna do without allotments and without the ability to grow tobacco at any kind of scale. So at that time, we transitioned them to begin growing fruits and vegetables. We provided all the training and technical support they needed to access large retail markets up and down the Northeast coast. And we also provided, and we still do provide, aggregation and distribution support. So if I have a farmer over there that has six boxes and a farmer over there that has 27 and a farmer over there that has 500 boxes, they're all welcome to work through our food hub and then we get all of that aggregated produce to large retailers. Um, we help them get to those large retailers, which allows them to stay on family farms, which supports the culture and the tradition in central Appalachia um, through one of its largest industries, which is agriculture. Since we opened the Appalachian Harvest Food Hub, farmers have earned more than $24 million in income. And without that work and without that intervention that we provide uh, in that space, those farmers would probably not have access to those markets. So we're really proud of that very good work. In 2017, we started noticing that there was a real interest in native Appalachian botanicals. So nestled within our food hub, we opened an herb hub. We serve producers there and we offer drying, processing, aggregation, and packing services, just like we do for our fruits and vegetable farmers. And we know that we are helping people with limited resources. We are helping people that have been harvesting native botanicals for multi-generations in many cases, now reach markets that are much more lucrative, that are much more equitable. In 2017, the industry was valued at over $8 billion, and with demand growing at 5% a year, we know that we've got a lot of work to do in that space. We're connecting knowledge keepers, and we're connecting them with young folks. And by doing that, we know um, that we're serving tiny rural communities, and we're helping people be valued again, and we're helping tell the tales and sharing information about what's important for all kinds of age ranges in Central Appalachia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And we'll move on to Bill Slagle. Good morning, can everyone hear? Are we good to go? Yes, we are, thank you, Bill. Well, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. And we can, we counted the privilege to be uh, a native Appalachian uh, individual that grew up in, in Western North Carolina and, have, and has had the opportunity to, to travel the world and see uh, what other communities look like. And in the end, have ended up back where we started. So, so love this part of the country. Uh, the, the comment that I'd like to make today about outdoor spaces and, and economic development is very simple. The two go hand in hand. And what we're seeing at the Economic Development Partnership is with our existing industries that, that make up the bulk of jobs that, that are throughout North Carolina, and I'm sure this holds true for, for all the other areas that are represented today, these companies that are already invested into the local communities have really had a mind shift over the last five years about the outdoor activities and the value that they bring their, to their to their employees and and so so what we're hearing when when we sit with individuals that are either looking to put a new facility or to expand a facility into a certain community is they want to know the nuts and bolts of that community and, and I would start by saying many of these companies that we deal with, whether they're existing or whether they're new companies that are looking at the 
at the opportunities before them. They are in your communities well in advance before a decision is made. Uh, there's multiple examples that I could give you where the CEO or the business recruiter for the company or the site consultant or whoever, they're walking your streets six to eight months before um, they actually make a decision. They're subscribing to your local newspaper. They're looking at your strategic plans. And, and so they're making a connection with the communities that, that they want to consider well in advance before you're even aware of it. So, so I say that to say this. So what your community um, does in terms of strategic planning becomes extremely important. And, and creating, there is a direct link to, to the communities that do, do good strategic planning and then also implementing that planning. Uh, there's multiple examples around Western North Carolina where communities have, have, have taken the green space opportunity in the outdoor economy and built full micro economies off of, off of, of those, those opportunities. So, uh, you know, I, I would say this is that the outdoor living and, and healthy environments are now a top criteria. And, and when we get ready to check that box for communities that are gonna be considered in the, in, in the final evaluation period is companies and, and individuals, because it's important to them as an individual, they want that same culture coming over to, to where they're gonna be as a member of the, of the corporate community. So having those plans in place and identifying what you want your community to be becomes extremely important important in the conversations that, that we have with companies. So conveying that message, telling your story becomes extremely important and sharing that that vision that that that, that you want to portray out there to, to draw people and, and and small companies or large companies to your community becomes extremely important. You know, my wife loves and I have to admit that, that I do too. We love watching the Hallmark Christmas movies and, and everybody wants a Hallmark community, but to get to those, those endpoints, there, there's a lot of steps along the way. And, and I would just encourage you connect with those organizations like North Carolina Main Street, connect with those organizations that can help you tell your story and, and, and continue to educate the local leadership, whether it's your county commissioners, your city council, or your county manager, or your city managers, or whatever. Keep that story out in the forefront. Keep those analytical points out before the people that, hey, this is a this has a positive return on the investment that that, that our community is looking for. So having that before the public as well as your local officials becomes extremely important. And keep in mind. And I'll, I'll close by saying this is you don't know who's walking the streets of, of your community. So having that community uh, and having that vision and having that strategic plan out there is so critical. And then finally, the implementing of that and, and making the financial investment that it requires is, is absolutely key to helping my job be easier in selling a community when a, com when, when a company or a, a small business owner or whatever is looking for somewhere, somewhere, somewhere to relocate or to locate uh, their facility. And, and, and so I would just fin finally say that we have a lot of opportunities because of the natural assets in, in uh, especially Western North Carolina. So uh, utilize those assets that, that best fit your local community and, and tell the story and, and, and tell that story as much and as often through the various social channels or getting in front of those, those leadership people that can, that can tell your story in places that you may never have access to. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Bill. We are going camping this weekend to use some of those resources or enjoy those. Um, Regina Sires, you're up next. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Good morning. 
Can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. And I would like to thank AARP um, and all the participants for being here today, for being interested in a livable uh, Appalachia. And a little background on Appalachian Agency for Senior Citizens. We are one of 25 area agencies on aging in the uh, state of Virginia. And just to let you know that there are area agencies on aging or commissions on aging in every state and tribal, un and tribal units as well uh, in, in the United States. So please, uh, if you haven't met them or don't know them, I recommend that you reach out to them as well. But we serve in Southwest Virginia, uh, four, community, four counties, Buchanan, Dixon, Russell, and Tazewell counties. We have been in business since 1975. And since 1975, we've not only, we have expanded our services from the older American Acts, traditional programs such as Meals on Wheels, uh, care coordination, and in-home services to open up uh, a, a lot of other businesses well. And uh, Gil, as you said, you do have to think differently uh, in, in our communities. Well, we also have to think differently in our aging services as well. And our mantra at our agency is that we think geometrically, we have to think on every surface angle and plane as well uh, to develop these programs. We have uh, moved our uh, traditional programs We've moved from a social model to a business model to not only uh, serve people that are of low income, but we serve all people and we serve other businesses. Our mission is to advocate, plan, develop, implement and promote independence with a high quality of life for healthy aging that benefits individuals and families of all ages in a sustainable livable community. And I'm just going to hit some highlights of some of our services that we have. Uh, and one of those is public transportation. Uh, not only do we have public transportation, but we also have PACE medical transportation, contracted transportation, veterans transportation, and we have just finished up a grant for a non-emergency medical transportation program to um, transport individuals to, to their chemo radiation treatments and also dialysis or any surgical appointments as well, and how important it is to keep our community healthy, as Gil and everyone has, has mentioned earlier. I'm not going to tell you a whole lot about the transportation program because I want you to come back to one of the next summits and see some of the things um, that we are doing in, uh, in our transportation program as well. Um, one of the other programs that we have uh, started is care transitions. We work with our local hospitals uh, to reduce uh, those readmissions, those unavoid or those avoidable readmissions to the hospital. It's a cost savings program to Medicare and to Medicaid as well, but it also improves the health and the quality of life for those individuals. We have reduced uh, the readmission rate from 20, I think it was 21 or 22 percent down to 6.8 percent, which uh, is uh, very uh, um beneficial to the to the community and to the hospital and to those individuals as well. Uh, we have also, uh, we have three, currently we just opened our third adult day center. Uh, I believe that we are going to have to change that name to a, adult activity center. Our seniors really uh, prefer that it is activity because those are the things that we do. Um, a reminder that if you don't have an adult day center in your community, uh, consider that or an adult activity center, but we have intergenerational uh, day, day centers as well. These provide these adult day centers provide families um, with a sense of comfort and confidence that their loved one is it's safe and in a healthy and safe environment that they are being um, uh, served and it also prevents isolation. We've talked a lot, we've heard a lot about socialization. And I think this pandemic has certainly told, shown everyone a little bit of the isolation that our seniors um, experience on a daily basis. Uh, we also, so consider those, there's a lot of wonderful things, a lot of programs that we do in our adult activity center as well. Um, our senior, we also have a senior living community. Uh, when Brian Beck, our CFO, and I took, uh, we inherited a mobile home park um, several years ago, and as Gil said, we had to think differently. We had to change our attitude 
uh, because it was a college route mobile home park. So we started developing that as some of our younger individuals left the community. We started purchasing those mobile homes. And again, I'm not going to tell you everything about that because we will also be panelists for housing as well. And you'll hear all about our award-winning affordable housing projects uh, with our senior living community. But as Gil says, we changed our perception. We changed the name, we rebranded it, and we started calling it our AASC senior living community. And by having that senior living community, um, we are providing a lot of uh, affordable and it is located on our campus. So our, our individuals do have access to a lot of our other programs. And when you think of housing, um, one of the things that we've been thinking about in housing is partnering with our local community college. We are uniquely um, our uh, situated, located near a community college, near a community service board as well. We are in an industrial park. So our aging, our services are in an industrial park. So we are part of the business development community as well. Um, but we have looked at working with partnerships with having students, college students to partner and to have housing and to share housing with our seniors. Uh, this would be a great way for our seniors to impart their knowledge to give a home to maybe some of these um, foster children who are aging out of the program as well, but still provide some um, uh, independence for them and independence for the seniors um, as well as our community, but work out a wonderful partnership with this. They do this in some other countries, and we would love to potentially start to do that as well. Uh, again, I don't want to give too much away about our housing so that you can hear from our CFO, Brian Beck, later on. But we have also worked with, we have a PACE program, a program for the all-inclusive care for the elderly. And having come from the medical uh, world um, as both medical uh, um, technologist and uh, administrator, uh, uh, a physician practice administrator and a laboratory administrator. I can tell you that the PACE program is one of the most wonderful healthcare programs that we have. Um, not only do we manage their medical care 365 days a year, but we do manage their social determinants of health. Uh, one of our employees' husband said, um, you all get to know everything about them except their underwear size. And our nurse practitioner said, oh, we know that too because we have to buy the pens. So we really do get to know these individuals and to know them well and to work with their families and to make their home life, We, you know, the behavioral, the environmental, uh, we manage all those. We build ramps, we build um, we, we make sure they have the assistive devices in their homes. We make sure that their roads are passable and that we're able to get to them. Um, one of the county administrators that we work with, he paraphrased, I'm going to paraphrase him. He says, if a senior lives, leaves our community, we not only lose revenue, but we lose the opportunity to bring younger generation back to our community. And I think that he is he is spot on with that. So when you connect at the intersection, we've tried to connect what we call the intersection. We're connecting housing, we're connecting aging, we're connecting transportation, and we're also connecting healthcare. Your area agencies are able to do that for you and within your community. Just be sure to reach out to them, um, develop those partnerships with them, and invite them to your table and invite yourself to their table as well. Uh, as we say, um, say yes, develop those resources to make those connections. And liberal communities aren't just about improving lighting, sidewalks, placement of curbs or park benches, but it's truly about integration and connection and creating that infrastructure with partnerships that do embrace um, aging within a community. So thank you. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you very much, Regina. And next we'll hear from Brixie Carlton. Hey, good morning, everybody. I think it's still morning for y'all. It is here in Middle Tennessee. I'm Brixie Carlton. I represent Governor Bill Lee on the Appalachian Regional Commission Board. And I think you'll have several panelists from ARC or that work with ARC on this. So I wanted to kind of um, give you just a little bit about ARC real quick. I've been working with ARC for several years. I've seen a lot of things change even in just eight or nine years. 
ARC covers 420 counties from New York to Mississippi. And ARC's vision is to reach economic parity with the nation. We're undergoing a new strategic plan right now and some, changing some things in our strategic plan, but the vision for re, to reach economic parity is gonna stay the same. ARC is primarily a grant making agency. We do basic public infrastructure, workforce development, tourism projects, things like that. Um, but one of the exciting things about working in Appalachia is seeing the growth. Sometimes Appalachia gets a bad reputation, um, but it, there is a lot of growth going on in Appalachia and it is exciting to see that. There are new industries, there are new industry clusters. We've talked a lot about kind of outdoor recreation and how that leads into tourism, new economic growth. Um, one example of that is the number of distressed counties. So if you rank all the counties in the United States from the top to the, to the bottom based on unemployment rate and poverty rate and income, uh, the bottom 10% are distressed. And in Tennessee, we've moved from 26 distressed counties in 2013 down to nine. So that just shows that um, the communities in Tennessee are improving um, in many different ways. Uh, just a couple of stats for you that um, kind of relate to what we're, we've been talking about today. ARC publishes a chart book. It's on their website. It's really easy to find on their website. And one thing they look at is just kind of where is the region as a whole? Um, talk about distressed counties, talk about population, aging, all things, things like that. Um, most of the region is losing population. Um, Central Appalachia, where a lot of us are, is growing, but overall the region is losing population. 18% of the population is over 65 with a median age of 41. That is three years older than the U.S. median age. Most of Northern and Central Appalachia have 20% of the population that's over 65. Um, and that, especially in the rural areas, that average exceeds the national average by more than two, per two percentage points. And as you all know, it's increasing in all of the U.S. And then the good thing about um, working, well, there's also a correlation between health and prosperity. It's the chicken or the egg. Or do healthy people, are people healthier because they are wealthier or uh, vice versa? A ARC did a diseases of despair study. It's a terrible name, but they did that a couple of years ago and saw that ARC has higher rates of terrible diseases, preventable causes of death, like overdose, suicide, liver disease. But one of the areas where the whole Appalachia really excelled was the number of social connections. We've talked about that a lot at Gilhood on that, that um, the social connections are more important than healthcare and how people age. So you, you can also find along with that diseases of despair, some information from ARC on hot spots and bright spots. So spots in Appalachia where they are doing better health-wise than expected. Sequatchie County in Tennessee is one of those. They are known for attracting affluent retirees. A lot of those from Chattanooga, which is close by. They have a strong religious community that promotes a healthy lifestyle, eating healthy, not using alcohol, physical activity, and they have a lot of coordinated health programs. So if you wanna see kind of what some communities who are doing better health-wise um, in Appalachia, you can look at that, those bright spots. And then uh, talking just a little bit about a couple of programs and things that, programs that we work with in Appalachia. Um, in a lot of ways, we don't consider aging. We, what we focus on on ARC kind of um, is enough. We focus on preserving Appalachian culture. We focus on access to infrastructure or to um, education. We focus on that goal of having parity with the nation. And we focus on having a, a healthy community and a healthy workforce. So all of that kind of ties into aging, even if it doesn't address it um, directly. And kind of what Gail talked about as well, that boomers like what millennials like. Um, outdoor spaces are important to young people and older people, economic growth benefits the whole community. Um, and I think that resonates with a lot of us who are on this, on this call. Um, when we do consider aging, how do we consider aging? Um, making sure, and we've hit on this as well, making sure that all ages are present in planning. 
Um, you know, with COVID, is online better or worse for more participation? For us, we have a lot of public meetings. You can have tons more participation if it's online. Um, and that's been a great way for us to hear from more people in the community than would normally show up at a public meeting. Intergenerational act initiatives, um, Regina talked about that. Um, senior centers, not just being senior centers anymore, but having uh, opportunities for more people to participate. And we also have already kind of hit on entrepreneurship, especially social entrepreneurship. We have a lot of entrepreneurship programs in our department. And um, we have a lot of people who have retired and want to start businesses, particularly businesses that are focused on social benefits. So, um, and then infrastructure, ensuring infrastructure is in place. Again, that also benefits everybody, but particularly those who want to age in place. A couple of examples of projects that um, do a really good job of this. One of ours in Tennessee is called Retire Tennessee. And it is a program that used to be based out of our Department of Economic and Community Development, moved it to tourism because most people start coming to Tennessee as tourists and then decide to move here. But we actively recruit active retirees to Tennessee, get them involved in the community, um, make sure that we have processes in place and systems in place that help those people. We have good healthcare systems in the retired Tennessee communities. We have available housing in those communities. And then we have fun things for people to do with attractions and festivals. Um, it's really focused on bringing money and people to Tennessee. Um, and it helps us uh, balance growth in those growing areas. It's really focused on getting people into our rural communities, which is great. But those communities really respect retirees and really enjoy it when older people um, come to their community. Another example is our um, Healthy Built Environment grants. So those are from the Tennessee Department of Health and they intentionally benefit, uh, we haven't called it this, but I like it, the eight to 80. Um, trails, parks, greenways, as a way to promote physical activity and increase health. And then and kind of along with that, as part of COVID, we established a task force to use our, our recreation lands for fishing, kayaking, hike, hiking. So the state lands that are kind of sitting empty, you know, managed maybe by the Corps of Engineers or by TVA or by state departments to take advantage of those more often. People were wanting to get out more, let's make sure we can get out more. And then as Regina kind of hit on, co-locating services within senior centers is an initiative of ours, making them a place for social activity, for volunteer opportunities, access to healthy food, and intergenerational activities. So those are a couple of initiatives. I can talk more about those if y'all have questions about those, but um, it's good to be with y'all today. Thank you very much, Betsy. Um, and thank you to all our panelists. I have a couple questions that people have posed and um, I'm not sure this is directed at any one person, but here's one from Anne. She asked, do you know of a community that has tried to catalog interests and skills of everyone to then engage each resident in at least one volunteer activity each year? I'll jump in just a little bit. I don't know of a community that's done that well. I know of churches that do that well. And I think if we can kind of, a lot of churches expect you to be on a committee and expect you to uh, do that, you know, almost every year. And I think if we can uh, copy that model in our communities, that would be excellent to get people more involved and to set it as an expectation. Great, thank you. Um, Another from Kim is she asks, it seems that real estate developers do a good job adding roads as required, but aren't required to add green spaces. And she asked why. Anyone have a, would like to weigh in on that? Sorry, I don't want to dominate this Brixie again. Um, but I think um, it looks like Gil's not on, but I think he would say it's because we haven't made them. Um, we haven't made that a priority. We haven't made that a requirement. We haven't told our cities that we want green spaces every time a new road is added. And I think that is something that we can do. And again, it's something that COVID made us see is really important, turning those parking spaces into outdoor eating spaces. We have put a lot of money into that over the last year is to make those outdoor spaces more available and more usable by our businesses. 
And I think when people start telling communities that it has to be that way, that's the only way it's gonna change. Thanks, Brixie. And someone said they like the point of future businesses looking ahead at communities plan and implementation of green space as part of their decision making process. Um, do I had, I had a question along the lines of economic development. Um, do you have suggestions on how economic development and business um, kind of support and entrepreneurship can be more implemented or tied into community planning and future development. Erica, Erica what I would say on that is um, it's important to be in front of the, the, the company leaders because most of those companies, they want to take the part in community development, but getting, getting your message in front of, of, of the, the local leadership from that company or small business uh, becomes very important. And, and asking them to, to, to take a seat at the table becomes really important because many of the community-based uh, companies, whether, again, it's small or large companies, they have community uh, investment funds. And a lot of times they, they like to pour those dollars back into the local community where they're operating. And, and so, but they wanna be part of the decision-making process. So, so companies need to be brought to the table early one, because they have a lot of wisdom around growth and development, but two, they have a lot of desire to see the community that they're in do well because it reflects well on them if they're trying to attract new customers through their business. So having those folks at the table early in the planning process and, and, and again, just asking them for their ideas and, and then maybe implementing one, one particular point that they recommended so that they, they can see that, that what they're saying and suggesting is, is, is being received and, and put into place. So uh, again, ha having those folks at the table becomes extremely beneficial to, to, to well-groomed and well-managed communities. Yeah, I agree with Bill. I think in a lot of our communities, we are willing to you know kind of give away the farm when we're creating businesses. And I think it's appropriate to ask those companies that are coming to be involved in your community to just, you know, automatically get involved in the, um, the chamber board and to do things like that. And some of them do it already. I think one of the things we've noticed in Tennessee is, you know, we're building a new facility, especially like here in Nashville, uh, the, they used to put like a green roof on top and that would be kind of their contribution. And now they're building campuses that have walking trails that anybody can use and just kind of bigger, just thinking a little bit bigger now. And it's important that we ask for that. I, I would like to share too, as a nonprofit, we have a really diversified funding strategy for our programming. So we are funded by ARC and other kinds of grantors, US, other USDA funders. Um, but we also get a lot of investment from local businesses that have ESG strategies that they're trying to fulfill. And so we're able to leverage that and say, because of the work that we do in sustainable agriculture and food systems, how can we support your initiatives and give you a return on this investment? And what is what are you trying to accomplish with your talent recruitment and the culture that you're trying to create within your organization? So early conversations, lots of info sharing and transparency, we have found to be very important and very effective. Um, I think I saw in the chat, this is Regina, I saw in the chat, how do you encourage influencers and business leadership to become aware of the economic value of aging? And the way that we have done that is actually we attend our supervisors, uh, our county supervisors and our local um, councilman meetings, and we do show them the services that we offer and how we've had, we have grown from a seven a business of um, seven million to over 19 million, and how we did that by adding services to our community 
building adult day centers as well. So now every county comes to us and says, we have an abandoned school, what can you all do with it? <laughs> and so we say, well, what can we all do with it? And some of those are multi-purpose. You can make those multi-purpose. You can have healthcare in there. You can have senior housing. You can have student housing. You can have healthcare. You can have retail shops. You can have restaurants. There's a lot of things that you can do within those. So really it was, it was as someone said, uh, joining the chambers talking to those business leaders going before them and us as an area HC on aging, what do we have that we think our community needs? And so that's how we presented it is we presented what our community needed, what we had and how we can offer that to the community. And for right now, one of the things that we are pushing is educate and vaccinate. So we are actually working with the local businesses going in educating their employees and we're, while we're there, if you want a vaccine or a booster or whatever, we are taking care of you in your place of employment and that prevents the loss of labor hours and stopping production and everything. So we presented it that way to them and the businesses go, oh, ding, ding, that works. Yes, we can do that. So it is making them aware of what you have available and, and, and offering that to them. Sounds a lot like more open and integrated communication among a variety of different groups and individuals would be it's important to make those connections. Uh, do you all think, and maybe this is you know, to Regina as well, uh, when you're talking about your adult day facilities, of how we can assist, um, maybe expand those or connect those into walking trails and more green space. And I've heard about uh, multi-generational facilities that have childcare as well as adult daycare and playgrounds and um, kind of addressing a lot of what Gil talked about earlier. Um, do you have examples where that's happening or suggestions on how we can advance those issues in our own communities? Well, we actually, at our main office, at our main campus, we do have the intergenerational program. Um, and so with that, we have community garden. And so our students and our community does come together. We have to raise uh, garden beds. We have one that part of our senior living community, which is also adjacent to our main campus here, that um, um, every year we have, uh, we usually plant uh, potatoes, and then those go out in the community to our seniors as well. So the individuals that live in the senior community are allowed to use that um, that garden, that green space that we have, and that has worked out extremely well. And then they share, uh, you know, they, they share the, the, the fruits of their labor from that. But we would also like to partner because of where our senior living community is, and we are partnered near the community college. There's some walking trails with the community college, and we do have a business owner that has land beside ours. And we do want to develop a walking trail that would encompass both the children and the adults, the intergenerational program, and so that they could actually either walk or even have a bike path or a golf cart path to go over to the college and have cultural programs and uh, a lot of other things, but then they would be uh, part of that trail and it would be like a one mile trail as well. So, uh, or a little, little longer than that. So, and you can see that, we'll show that in our housing uh, project, we'll, sh we'll show that. Um, on our next um, uh, summit as well uh, for that. But yes, you can develop that. And in our newest um, uh, facility, there is area again for a green space and to bring that community in there to volunteer, to work with their, um, the individuals that are partic the participants there at the activity center uh, and to develop a trail there as well. Lots of green space. We have it in Appalachia. And Gil, any, any um, final comments? Well, no, I, I've been listening to all the presentations. Very exciting. I think there is, you're doing so much, but also there's so much more to do. I also, I would say that a lot of the companies that are moving in, uh, as an example, in the city of Miami, the mayor visits every CEO, but not to ask him for money or anything, to ask him for the CEO's participation on the board of a not-for-profit in the city. So say, okay, you, you chose a city you wanna leave, you, you wanna set up here, 
we want you to give us, give back a few hours a month to sit on a board of a not-for-profit. Uh, and then that person gets engaged and it's even more important than the money because once that person gets engaged with the local community, then they give the money and, and, and more than the money also human resources and talent. Also, a lot of the people that are moving into the Appalachian region also, they wanna give back. They wanna be part of the community. Many are retired people the older people in, in, in the Appalachian region, for example, looking at through the numbers in North Carolina, uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, the proportion of zero to 17 or the over 65 is much higher the over 65 than the rest of the state. Uh, well, many of those people have amazing experience and knowledge and they wanna give back. So maybe they can also develop linkages with young people, either tutoring kids in high school or taking care of, 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 of little kids or teaching music or even for other older adults to teach painting or to, or, or to teach ceramics uh, or reading or organize walking groups. For example, we need people to be physically active but people, when they, when they don't have a group, they look out the window and they say, oh, it's too sunny or it's too rainy. Or it's, but if there is a walking group, then they show up. And they show up, they say, oh, it's because of the walking. No, they say it's because of the walking, but the reality is about sociability. It, it, it's about loneliness. It's about being with other people. So I think taking advantage and providing, facilitating that people actually volunteer and do other groups I think that that, that, that that is something. Also to pay a lot of attention to the low income areas, because also in the low income area, the intergenerational is, is critical because many of the parents have two and three jobs to survive. So usually their grandparents are playing an important role in that community, but then that community needs to have even better parks and sidewalks and, and, and places and, and to, uh, to facilitate. Uh, but also to keep in mind that anything that is intergenerational is a win-win. One of the most effective ways to eliminate ageism is when there is a mix. For example, I saw in Arizona wonderful uh, seniors housing in the middle of the campus of the university. And it works fantastic. And also the university is allowing the older people in that housing to take courses, not necessarily for a master's degree or for anything, just to take courses in general. And, and it has worked so well in Arizona, they began with the seniors communities like 25, 30 years ago, and they have not worked very well because older people don't wanna be only with older people. They wanna be with everybody, with all, with regular adults, with youth, with children. And instead, this kind of community, these buildings in the middle of the campus, but also take advantage like the Appalachia State University. They should have uh, hundreds of courses for older people. Older people are hungry of knowledge. They wanna take courses on nature, on gardening, on painting, on music, on history. On, and the university has hundreds of people doing masters and PhDs. They would be the professors. They have classrooms available. They have all of the software for uh, registration. So it would be really, really simple not to do one or two isolated course that is the exception, no, but to offer hundreds and throughout the year. And that will also provide part of that sociability and, and happiness to everyone. So it's piggybacking into a lot of the already good infrastructure that exists and see how to make it uh, available for other activities. Wow, what a great way to put a cap on it, Gil and everyone. Thank you for your insightful comments, sharing your experience and insight today. What did you get out of today's session for those of you who joined us? What was your gold nugget? What's your take home? Please type it into the comment section. Is there one thing that's really standing out for you that you wanna take with you? Uh, one result of this summit is going to be that you will receive a, a, a link to a document that will have a summary of some of the um, recommendations that have been made so that you and your local governments and community planners can, can have a tool to be inclusive of age. 
As has been mentioned several times, this is the first in a series, and um, we hope you'll join us on October 15th for another extraordinary conversation with community leaders, both national and local. If you attended today's session and you're interested in learning more, volunteerism, sociability, social connectedness was mentioned several times. Maybe you're interested in learning more about AARP in your community. And so we posted a few email addresses up here for you if you're interested in getting involved with AARP in North Carolina, Tennessee, or Virginia. Um, so with that, we're gonna close out today's session with our huge gratitude to our speakers and to every Everyone who came here to be with us today. Um, thank you for joining us and have a great weekend and we'll see you soon.